Chapter 21 Finally The reader will certainly be wondering what happened in my life after that Rachel van Dyliard incident, and what I did. Well, a lot happened. Many events took place and many changes occurred. In 1973, I had been advised by Uriel to do something to bring myself to the attention of the media in order to help publicize the message without seeking or courting fame for myself. But that in itself turned out to be unfeasible. How could I make myself get myself noticed by the media, but without becoming famous myself? Well, as I said earlier on, I had begun to write up a lion's message when Rachel van Dyliard came to stay at my house and tried to murder my baby boy. Philippe and I married on the 19th, 19, of May 1990. Marcus, the UK Raelian guide at that time was invited, with two Scandinavian-born Raelian brothers called Kai and Jan Paulden. As I remember, only one of the two brothers came. Marcus with whom I was still talking from time to time spent a few minutes asking me why I had got married. He seemed absolutely astonished and quite outraged that though I had read Rail's book, I still got married. I quietly answered him that there was nothing wrong with marriage. I believe he understood at that moment that I was not really one of them, and stopped telephoning me. As Philippe and I settled into married life, I continued writing up the message, while he took care of all domestic duties. But he developed what I can only call an unhealthy curiosity in my manuscripts, asking me to give them to him to read as soon as I had finished every installment. I used to copy out the message by longhand during the day, and typed it up by night. While I typed, Philippe furiously read all the religious books I had. Then he discovered two other manuscripts that I had not told him about, which were going to follow the message, and which I had written the year before I even decided to access the message. Then he insisted on typing up the message for me, saying that I would finish accessing it quicker that way. At first I refused, but he made a fuss and threw a tantrum, moaning that I did not trust him enough. Finally for peace of mind, I showed him how to use the Amstrad PCW and he began to type it. Unknown to me, he also typed up my other two manuscripts, kept the discs they were on, without saving the text on the hard drive. When I finally finished accessing the message, I wrote about myself and even about what had happened with Rachel I typed up the rest, then contacted a small publishing company in London. I wanted them to simply print the book and deliver all copies to me, with the intention of selling them slowly after I had sought publicity as I had been advised to. On the day when the representant of the publishing house was due to be given the manuscript and the first installment of the printing fee, I was very ill with influenza, so my husband received him. It seems Philippe insisted on telling him exactly what the manuscript was about, then he also handed him the copies of the other two manuscripts he had typed without my permission. Meanwhile, as well as writing up the manuscript, I had become very unhappy that I did not have somewhere to pray in private. I have already explained about my religious background earlier in this book so I will not come back to that. Suffice it to say that, because I am a Jewish housewife whose ancestor happened to have followed Rabbi Yeshua Bar Joseph of Nazareth, I found myself in a kind of religious no man's land. I regularly attended the Orthodox Jewish synagogue next door to my house, but they were, and are not Essenes, therefore they do not practice the Essene disciplines, and as a result I missed that side of my Jewish faith. Also I was not a Christian, even though I believe in Yeshua's teachings, so church was not good for me. As an Essene I was not quite an Orthodox Jew. That is why I needed somewhere else in order to practice my Essene religion in the way I am accustomed to. The only way I could properly practice my faith was to have somewhere private and close at hand, where I could go mostly for prayers. As Essenes, we pray three times a day, morning, noon, and in the evening, and sometimes at midnight too. Every month I need purification. In the Essene training, we also have angelic communions, communing with certain angels every day of the week, to build and celebrate the holy temple of God in us. Now, I cannot do all this inside the house in which I live. It has to be outside and somewhere where I can touch the floor, which must be an earth floor, with no concrete on it for communion with the angel of earth. The place is to be what we call an oratory, a sanctified place dedicated only to prayer. There are also certain traditions unique to us, which demand that we build such a place. 
For example, when someone dies, we tie a piece of cloth, usually white cloth, around our wrists. We call it a mourning band. It allows one to be in touch with the spirit of the dead person for a whole year. If you had done something wrong to that person while they were alive, and were not there at the time of their death, and so you had no opportunity to say sorry, you may use the mourning band to communicate with them and say, I did this or that to you and never apologized, please forgive me. Also, if that person had done something to you and you never forgave them, you can use it to forgive them and make peace with them in the same way. After a whole year, on the anniversary of their death, there is a festival to celebrate the former life and the departure of the dead person, and also to free their spirit so that it can continue on with its life in whatever the Lord has decided for them. At that time all the mourning bands pertaining to him are burnt in a censer and the ashes are buried in the tabernacle. Since I came to Britain until 1992, many members of my family and relatives back in Cameroon had died, so I had accumulated a considerable number of mourning bands. But I had been unable to burn them because I had nowhere to perform the ceremony. So, truly, those spirits, even though they had been freed by all my relatives in Africa, nonetheless had not yet been freed by me. My grandmother wrote to me and said that there were three members of the family whose spirits had appeared to her in dreams, complaining that I still had their bands, so they were in limbo and still waited to be completely freed. This might sound incredible, but it is because we are so down to earth and close to nature that we can communicate with spirits in this way. Also when a child is born, there is the tiny bit of the umbilical cord that is left attached to the baby's navel after the cord is cut. When this falls, we do not just throw it away. We keep it in remembrance of the deep mystery of how the Lord makes a woman bear a child in the womb and keep it alive, fed, warm and growing until it is big enough to be born. We respect that miracle, and because of deep spiritual laws connected with the creation of a human being, we bury that tiny bit of umbilical cord in the consecrated place. The foreskin of the circumcised boy child is also given the same treatment and buried the same way. My last two children's umbilical ceremonies had therefore not been properly carried out. My sons are still awaiting circumcision, because I did not have anywhere consecrated to bury their foreskins. My last son at that time was already three years old, while he should have been circumcised when he was eight days old. One of the most important parts of our religion concerns purification. In Cameroon, we used to have purification pools, which we used regularly at certain times of the month, especially for women. For example if I cannot purify myself immediately after the time of the month when I have my period, so I can sleep with my husband, then deep inside me that hurts me, because according to my religious belief, I know I am defiling him. No matter how many baths and showers I take, I still do not feel clean. In all the years I had been in England until I met my husband, I had never once been able to ritually purify myself in that way, as I could not find any place for that. If you have been brought up, grown up and lived in a certain way, if you cannot say your prayers in the way you are supposed to, if you cannot carry out the various observances and devotions that are laid out in your faith, then you end up feeling that you live a life that is not your own. You can no longer practice your traditions in a proper way, or to pass them on to your children. I came to feel like I was living in an open prison, because I was not really free to practice my religion, to be me. And that was something that was tearing me apart, and finally I came to feel as though I was dying slowly. The only answer I had, the only thing I could do was to build an oratory myself in my back garden. Everything in my life was tied to that. My garden was large, so I set to work. The oratory. My means were small, so when I started to build I used traditional methods. I constructed it in the same way we build native houses in Africa. Most houses in villages were built of mud in my time, even if they had concrete floors and wall rendering. And you do not see them falling down, because they last and last. Of course there are different methods of construction. They can be either square, round, rectangular, or in the form of a pyramid. If the walls are very thick, you do not need foundations. For my purpose it had to be made so I could have direct contact with the earth when I was carrying out my devotions. To build an oratory like the one I wanted, all you needed was a flat area like in my garden where you could build up the walls. 
The soil that is used is mixed with water and the heap is built up vertically. Some timber beams can be put on the corners to support a roof if so wanted. The soil is a living thing and if left there, it will just bond and establish itself. Plants will even grow on its walls and on the roof. It is exactly the same principle that is involved in building a mud hut with thick walls. Of course the walls must be straight. Once you have put it up and you have put the roof on, if using one not made of mud of course, it will stay there for a hundred years at least. In fact, if I had wanted to make it even stronger, and for it to last longer, I would have added some straw, but that was not necessary for what I wanted. In my village in Cameroon, building a house does not cost much in labor, as all members of the community far and wide are willing to give their help free when it comes to building dwelling houses. In fact, all houses in villages are built with help of the community. It is unheard of to find an individual toiling totally alone at building his home. Of course, in England I have remarked that things are a lot more complicated, people are selfish and there is absolutely no community spirit. Things cost much more, and the houses do not seem to even last that long and some even lack beauty. So I started building, and soon for the first time, after I consecrated the garden and the place where I erected the oratory, I managed to burn my accumulated mourning bands. It was about half finished when I wrote to the council, telling them what I was doing. I explained to them all the reasons why I wanted to have that mud building. It was a very long letter. I told them that I did not know if I was breaking any laws, or if I needed permission. The people from the council's planning department sent someone, a young man, to have a look. This young man was very excited by it. He stood in front of it taking photographs, and even passed me his camera to take a photo of him with it in the background. He kept saying that the oratory was fantastic, and that he had never seen anything like that before. He suggested that I should get in touch with the newspapers so that they may write about it, but I was not interested. Then I found out later that they had got in touch with the local press anyway, as the morning after that young man came, a reporter for our local paper, the Barking and Dagenham Post, showed up at my house with a photographer and asked me for an interview. The people from the planning department contacted me again saying that there had never been a law in the history of the United Kingdom against the building of such structures like the one that I had put up. And at the size it was, as far as they were concerned, the building could stay. They also said that they would have to consult the housing department, my landlords. If they said that that it was okay, then I could keep it. Meanwhile, the young reporter from the Barking and Dagenham Post decided to make more money, and sold his story to the national papers. But when the people from the housing department came, everything changed. They started bringing political issues into the matter. The man who first came to see me and who remained my liaison officer with my landlords and Mr. Belcher told me, I am afraid we simply can't accept this. If we start allowing one black lady to build a mud hut, we are going to see mud huts sprouting everywhere. Why should we allow someone from Africa to build a mud hut in our conservative British area? it will offend local people. At that time, the avenue where my house is, was part of the neighboring borough of Redbridge which was run by a conservative council. They said that already, some neighbors had complained, but that was a lie. The people occupying the houses around mine signed a petition saying that the hut should stay, and delivered it to the housing department. Then the housing department people said that some people round the back complained, but at the time, those people were so far away that I did not even regard them as my neighbors. Their houses face another road, and there was a piece of waste ground with trees between our gardens. So somehow, the housing department imposed their own priorities and brought up all these issues which had never even entered my mind when I was building the hut. They completely swept aside everything I had said about my reasons for building it. They said they had a duty to conserve their country, so that it was part of the Essex tradition, not part of Africa. On another visit Mr. Belcher had a companion with him who said to me, well, if you were white, it might be a different story, but we can't let you get away with it. It would set a bad example to the other blacks, and we have enough problems with them as it is. Afterward, as they were leaving, he denied having said any such thing, when I told him that I would reveal what he had said. He said, if you quote any of that, I'll just say you made it up, and it would put you in a bad light. 
that was very upsetting to me. To hear them go on, you would think I wanted to turn my garden into an African jungle, or to build a special greenhouse to grow palm trees in. Actually, I had heard that people could get grants for building such things. But I was not making such demands. All I wanted was an oratory, somewhere to practice my religion in the best way I know how, for me to actually fully live like a human being. I explained to them over and over again why the floor and inside had to be made of earth and not of any other material, but they just did not seem to listen. Some of the letters they sent were written in such a way that they gave me to understand that the house I lived in was theirs, and they could do what they liked to me. But they never made clear what had actually been decided or by whom, so it was very confusing. After that visit from the two housing department officers, they must have made a report, because the council people started to play dirty, and by now my face was regularly appearing on the front pages of national papers both in the UK and in Europe. Requests for radio interviews came from as far as Japan and Canada. When reporters went to my council people, they told them, the lady is homesick. She is tired of living in England, she hates it here and wants to go back to Africa. And the media just followed the council's line. When they came to interview me, I told them what I have reported here. But no matter what I said, they always decided that the council's declaration was the most newsworthy. It just came out as this African lady who wanted to build a mud hut in her back garden to remind her of home. They'd sit round and say, tell us about yourself, but in their articles, they'd ignore or twist what I had said. They'd watch my children come and go, and ask about what they liked. Then in their articles, they made a lot of the fact that I had so many children, and that they were loud and liked pop and rap music. So what? I have six children and they are normal healthy children. So, of course, at that time, they sometimes were a bit noisy. But the media turned this into a story about how I wanted this place to go to, to escape from my noisy children, so I could have a bit of peace and quiet. Or else they made me out to be an eccentric, someone who just got it in their head to build a mud hut one day, for the hell of it. The worst example for media attack was the article written by Barbara Emil in the Sunday Times. To begin with, she never interviewed me nor did she even telephone me. She simply asked her aides to collect cuttings from other newspapers for her, and on those cuttings she based her article. She, who is a Jew, argued that I should abandon some central aspects of my faith in order to fit in and be accepted as English. I regard that as an insult. When I first came to England, I only spoke my mother tongue, Yuando, and French. So I taught myself English. I have met some immigrants who had lived here some thirty years before I even arrived, and who could not speak a word of English. Who can say that I have not adapted? I cook English food better than some white English people I know, I do not only eat African food. Both my first and second husbands were white to begin with. I must say that Barbara Emile made a big mistake when she decided to write that article, boasting about her Kensington flat and mocking my supposed choice of curtains. So I twitched my mysterious little nose at her, their problems, imprisonments and family scandals are still making headline news even now. So in all these ways the media completely misrepresented the issue, which I felt was a horrible injustice. By then I was praying every day in the oratory, but was regularly interrupted by council officials strolling inside while I was reciting my prayers. When I complained at the council people's constant unannounced visits to my oratory and their intrusion on my devotions, they told me, if you want us to leave you alone, you have got to let us get our way. I explained that they were desecrating a holy place, but they just did not care. According to their attitude, the house belonged to them, and I could not have a holy place in it. It was quite an amazing scene on the day when the council officials visited. I was told one day in a telephone call that some people from the housing department would visit the following day before they made their final decision. I had expected a few of them to come, but I was absolutely amazed to see at least fourteen gentlemen standing outside my house. As they stood a while waiting for the leader of their group, my protective neighbors thought they had come again to cause me more upset and they began to heckle them and shout at them. Hair! What else do you want with Desiree? Why don't you go after criminals? Go away and leave her alone. Finally their leader arrived and they knocked on my door, 
and I forced them to all to take off their shoes, which is a religious law in my house that no outdoor shoes may be brought in my living room. Some of them were quite excited and complied with my unusual demand. They did not mind, it came with the job. But it had been raining and many of them were angry and very reluctant to take off their shoes off in order to pass through my house to go into my garden. But I had already written to their offices over this and told them about this rule, so they knew. It was quite hilarious to see these suited gents filing through my humble house with their shoes in their hands, and me mercilessly standing there, arms folded across my ample chest, with a determined expression on my face. There was one particular old man who was very angry over this, and when they came out again, at least nine of them arrogantly walked through my house wearing their shoes, refusing to take them off again. But they did this fast, while my back was turned. When I finally turned round and looked, the last ones were not so lucky, and I ordered them to remove their shoes again. I saw the old man who had been angry at taking his shoes off gesticulate, complaining about the poverty of my house and how it was therefore not necessary for them to remove their shoes. He also said that allowing me to keep the oratory was absolutely out of the question. Their press officer went and told the media that the structure was dangerous, that lumps of earth might fall off it. In fact it was rock solid. But the newspapers faithfully published what the press officer had told them. As for the council, I understood they were afraid that if I was allowed to keep the structure, it would be used as a precedent by other tenants to get more control over their environment. And they used the media to prepare the nation for what they had decided to do. So the next thing they did after that was to send some people in, escorted by two police officers, to knock it down. These three men came with all their equipment, but they could not knock the hardened walls down. So they took the roof off, which was much easier, and they did not stop at that. They used saws to damage the roof timbers so that they could not be used again. If they had known how I had built the roof, the timbers could have very easily been lifted off and reused, there was no need to cut them. They even cut the doors and windows that were lying aside on the floor, waiting to be fitted. They damaged these by cutting the wood into pieces so I could not reuse the doors. It was a really criminal act of vandalism. As these events unfolded, copies of my printed book had been delivered, and I had even placed them in a corner of the oratory at the time when the demolition squad came. The two police officers, a male and a female gleefully observed the three demolition men, whispering to each other then laughing aloud. As I shouted at the men not to cut my timber, the male policeman sidled up to me stood very close to me, and we had this amazing whispered conversation. He spoke in a way that only I could understand what he was saying. The way he spoke to me, it seemed to be a very personal matter. He also seemed to know a lot about me personally. Are you surprised that we are knocking your hut down? Well, we have to do it. The whole matter has gone on long enough. As I asked, but why are they destroying my timber? That is totally unnecessary. You started it, you started it. He retorted. You bastard Jews are all the same. In any color you come, you sons of bitches want to take over the world. We have to put an end to it, and this has to finish now, gone on long enough. I could not believe it. If anything I had hidden the fact that I was a Jew to the media, even though I had mentioned the fact that I was an Essene. How did he know about me having any biological connection with the Jews? I did not ask for a penny. I had used my savings to build the hut, and I had not asked for a refund when they asked me to demolish it. And now they were trying to destroy it while accusing me of pushing them around. All the time that the structure was being attacked, a huge crowd had gathered in my garden and the adjoining ones, and my neighbors was shouting at them to leave the hut alone. In fact, the attitude of all the spectators was one of silent anger. Only from time to time, my children's friends would jeer at sweating demolition people, remarking that a little woman built the hut, and three burly men could not demolish it. It was so strong that they could not knock it down, as they did not understand how it was built. All they managed to do was destroy its roof, but they had succeeded in their aim. After that, because of what they had done to my oratory, I no longer wanted to keep it. Because they had taken the roof off, I could no longer burn incense in it, and because so many unclean people had defiled it, it was no longer a holy place, it had been totally desecrated. 
I could, of course, reconsecrate the place, but I did not want to. So I began to slowly take the walls down myself. But even for me, this was very difficult to do. Council people were still coming every day, but went to my neighbor's gardens to look into mine. They must have been frightened that, that the roofless hut would stay there for a long time, since it had been raining every day, but the walls were still standing. Contrary to their previous, preposterous statement that the structure was dangerous and about to collapse, so they went to court to force me to totally demolish it. They took me to court to force me to do something that I was doing anyway. What a waste of taxpayers' money! They had even written beforehand to me, to threaten that I would have to pay the cost of their legal action. They said that they would seek to repossess the house and to evict me if I did not comply. Later, when they were interviewed, and asked by the journalists, they denied having said any of this or having asked me to pay for their legal action. The case came to court in January 1993, I defended myself and won. The judge listened to the whole story and admonished the counsel for the way they had handled the case, and rejected their request that I pay the costs of their legal action. He said that I could not be impeded or stopped from practicing my religion. He told me to demolish the rest of the walls, and ordered the council to seriously consider my planning application for a new structure, but that, I on my part, should go along with their requirement as to the outside look of the new structure. I could then build a mud wall on the inside. I agreed to build the new oratory to council specifications, what was important to me was to have a new holy place. I submitted my plans and obtained planning permission by return of post. As a result of all that happened I became famous, but that fame was not always to my advantage. People used to stare at me where they never did before. And because of that I have become more conscious of how people regard me. Some are still quite hostile even now. And as a result of all the publicity and the bad way the media reported on the issue, I started to receive hate mail and death threats from all sorts of people, especially from groups like the British National Party and for anti-Semites. Many times I woke to find that swastikas had been daubed on my door in chalk. Rashes of bacon were nailed on it, and even pushed through my letterbox. I received a very offensive letter that was accompanied with a leaflet depicting a rabbi holding a knife, asking me if I had had my son circumcised but I also got a lot of support from the Jewish and black communities. Being black and Jewish can have its advantages, as well as its problems. The congregation of the synagogue next door where I worship, and even Jews who did not worship there, were very helpful. They came to visit me while the oratory was still standing. When they saw the building they used to say, Oh, this is beautiful, not at all what we have been led to believe from the newspapers. We have a lot of cases of anti-Semitism in our area, so I would have understood if they had not wanted to get involved and put themselves in a position of suffering even more discrimination. But they stood by me. I also got a lot of support from the black community and from the Commission for Racial Equality, and from a Leeds-based human rights organization called SAFF, who advised me on my rights, and wrote letters to the police, the council, and to Jewish organizations. We talk about living in a multicultural society. It is supposed to welcome, or at least tolerate differences. Here we have people from many different cultures and religions, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims, Christians, Mormons, pagans and atheists, witches and more. We all live together, we cohabit without stepping on each other's toes. It is wrong for English people to tell everyone else to adapt their ways to be like them. The expression that the man from the council and Barbara Emile used was assimilate. They both said, you've got to assimilate to the British way of life. That to me meant, stop practicing your religion, and become a Christian. You should forget Hanukkah and Passover and start to celebrate Christmas and Easter. It is like someone telling you to get rid of your own soul. You cannot. I would have to die inside to become what they wanted me to be. As an Englishwoman, I understand that I must be able to speak English, I have to pay taxes if I have a job, I must vote and respect all the laws of the land, and not impose my beliefs on anyone or complain about their beliefs. That to me is assimilation enough. If English people went to Cameroon, even if they took Cameroonian nationality as many do now, 
no one there would say to them that they had to stop wearing their favorite clothes and start to wear African robes. No one there would say to them that they had to stop eating their favorite food and only eat Cameroonian food. No one there would expect them to abandon monogamy and adopt polygamy, which is legal there. As a matter of fact that is one law that many new white Cameroonians adopt with enthusiasm. No one there would even expect them to marry black Cameroonian girls unless they want to. No one there would say to them that they had to stop celebrating Christmas and start worshipping their Cameroonian ancestors. And the Englishman can go on celebrating Christmas till the cows come home and still be an accomplished Cameroonian in other respects. Anyway, as a lionin had asked me, I had made myself known and talked about in the media, even though it had not been intentional at that time. But I knew that when I eventually had the message published, I would be remembered. How well, I do not know. Now that people knew of my existence through the Mud Hut saga, I decided to use that period, while my name was still fresh in people's memories, but first I had to read my book and check that there were no printing errors. With all the circus scenes that had been going on at my house, I had not had the time, energy and power of concentration needed to read it, also I did not want to see anything upsetting before I was ready. As I had been saying a few times that I was finally going to read the book, I noticed that Philippe had become jumpy and looked worried. An annoying tick had appeared on the corner of his right eye, as it always did when he had done something, when he felt guilty or afraid of me finding out about something he had done. He tried to dissuade me from reading, asking that we should go window shopping in West London. I refused and reasoned that if we went to London, I would be too exhausted at our return, to read anything. He got angry, accusing me of being ashamed of him, and of not wanting to be seen out with him. This was ridiculous, and I told him so. As I picked up the book again he took it from my hand and put it on the piano, suggesting that we should go to the park and feed the ducks instead. I impatiently told him that I did not want to feed any ducks, I just wanted to read my book. Then I said, why do I have the feeling that you are trying to stop me from reading that book? He went bright red and lowered his eyes. He had this trapped expression of an animal caught in a car's headlights at night. I resolutely headed for the kitchen and told him that I was going to read my book, momentarily, after I had made myself a hot drink. I then locked myself in the bedroom with a cup of cocoa to finally read the book, and installed myself very comfortably on the bed. When I finally got to read, I was absolutely aghast. The beginning was nothing like I had written it. Also in it, there were materials from the other two manuscripts that I had written, and some other materials from my other projects that I had prepared, and that were supposed to follow the message. Virtually all the story of my meetings with Elianin had been left out. My criticism of Claude Verilne sounded like coming from a Christian, not from me, it did not seem to come from a Jew or an Essene. The bit about my ancestor leaving Israel and installing himself in Cameroon was left out. My meeting with my husband, my marriage and coming to England were left in, but the news headlines from my mud hut story that I had rushed to the printers at the last minute were left out. No mention of me being the same Desireen Tolo who built the mud hut appeared in the finished text. The book, in my opinion, was totally unreadable and had to be rewritten entirely. When I read it, I could follow the story, and understand it, and that with great difficulty. I reflected that no one who did not know my story could understand it. I stopped reading the book in order, but just leafed through it, reading just parts of the chapters. Mention of Verilne as the anti-Messiah was there, but what had been done to the book had greatly weakened the message it conferred and dampened its impact. I could virtually figure other readers thinking where did this come from, and why did she start the book this way? What exactly is important to her and what does she want to inculcate into us? And to top it all, the title of the book was now, The Antichrist Man 666 Named, Not the Sacred and the Profane. Also, there were some deeply Christian sayings at the end of the book that I knew were not written by me, and that could not have come from a layperson. They sounded to have been written by a priest or a theologian. After just thirty minutes, I shot down the stairs, angrily shouting Philippe's name. I found him in the back garden furiously cutting weeds with my machete. What happened to my manuscript? I shouted. Why did you read my other manuscripts and how dare you meddle with, 
and mess up my work. I made it very clear when you offered to type the manuscript for me, not a dot or a comma should be put in the wrong place. You give the impression of being a halfwit, but you obviously are not. What kind of monster did I marry? There was no way of him denying anything. Only he could have made those changes, and it could only mean that he had given his edited version of the manuscript to the publishers. Philippe, what have you done? I asked. He let go of the machete, dropped on the grass and burst into tears. Please don't reject me, don't divorce me, I could not bear it. I'd kill myself if we are ever separated, I swear. I left him sitting there and walked back inside, where he followed me. Why? I asked quietly. He replied, I did not want people to know the truth about Rail. I know that your message is such, that every single Raelian would be questioning the Elohim's message. Exactly what I had guessed, I looked at him now, not as my husband but as a Raelian. But what about everything I taught you? What about your baptism? What about all those prayers you say every day? What about that pardon I have heard you ask God for? And what about your baptism? Don't you believe in God anymore? Did you even ever believe? I asked him. Yes, he replied. I believe, I know you are telling me the truth about God, and I know that Rael could not possibly have been sent by Yahweh, or any good extraterrestrials. But I do not know why I did it. There was a great battle going on within me, and it felt so good to be wicked and hide the truth from people. He then went on to tell me that he had gone to the publishers with his own edition, and told them that it was the version I wanted to publish. Then he asked the printers to shred the original manuscript that I gave them, when they asked him if he wanted it back. As a result, I decided that the book could not be distributed. I had now lost the only funds I had put aside for self-publishing the message, and the results were totally useless. I came to look at my husband and see him in a totally different light. How could he sabotage my work in that manner, and also watch me give that money to the publishers, knowing that I could not possibly distribute that book when I had read it? I went to the printers and shouted the place down, asking for my manuscript back. The man, to whom it was given, casually told me that he no longer had it. When I asked him how he could not possibly have it, he then told me that after he read my manuscript, he had shown it to a Roman Catholic priest, a friend of his, and the priest had taken it to read it. After my husband had brought him the second manuscript, he had also given it to the priest, who had edited it and brought it back to him for printing. He said he had kept the original one titled The Sacred and the Profane. I could not believe what was happening and sat there bewildered, for a long time. Then I told the man to please, retrieve my manuscript from the priest. He promised he would ask his friend for it back. After several visits to him, he claimed that his friend had told him that, as it was so interesting, he had given it to his bishop, who had given it for reading, to a cardinal during a visit to Rome. Also his friend had now been assigned to another diocese in another county and he was still waiting for him to get in touch. I finally understood then, that I would never see my manuscript again. I told him that I wanted my money back, since he had not printed the manuscript that I had given him but he retorted that the money was for the printing work. When my husband had brought the second material to him, he had accepted it in good faith, as he had no reason to distrust him. Therefore any complaints that I had should therefore be settled between him and myself. I went back home and started looking for the discs in which I had saved the manuscript, and I could not find them. I switched on the PCW 9512 and checked the hard drive in which I had also saved all the chapters, but I found that they had all been erased. Another shouting match with Philippe followed. I forgot to say that it was now 1993. I was so angry with him that I ordered him out of our bedroom, and banished him to the sofa. How could I even want to sleep in the same bed as him after such a betrayal? My book was not just any work of sentimental poetry or needless fiction, and I was not battling any visible forces. I knew that any difficulties, any setbacks, and any attacks that came to me concerning that book, that message of a lion in could not be a matter of chance. I knew that Satan's hand was behind everything. Though Philippe had tried to escape Rail, Satan still had access to him, and could still manipulate him. Most of the time, he was something of a halfwit 
and could not be expected to do the clever work he had done with my manuscripts without a more powerful intellectual force guiding him. I began to think again about what had happened with Rachel. Philippe had taken my baby downstairs, which he should not have done really. He had left him in the carry-cot then he had come upstairs and got back in bed with me. When we had first heard Rachel screaming, he had pushed me down every time I tried to get up to go and see what was happening, trying to make love to me. My two boys had come and knocked on the bedroom door, and he had told me to ignore them. They then went and knocked for Christophe who was with us, and he had simply ignored them. If my two other sons had not come and banged on the bedroom door shouting at me to go down, my son would have surely died. I remember he kept telling me to ignore the children and not to go downstairs. Now I understood that Satan had used both Philippe and Rachel in his attempt to have my child murdered, to deter me from writing this message. While Rachel tried to kill the child, Philippe was trying to stop me from going and rescuing him. Suddenly, it dawned on me just how much peril I was in, while trying to obey a lionin. I had definitely been slowed down. I had lost my printed-out manuscript, the disks had disappeared and what had been saved on the computer's hard drive had been erased, and all the money that I had saved for the project had been lost. Now I was back to square one. If I wanted Elianen's message to see the light of day, I had to access it once more, from the beginning, in its entirety. I looked my husband straight in the eyes and told him that I would write that book again and I will publish it. Satan cannot stop me and he cannot kill me. Elianen promised to protect me and I believed them. Then I suddenly told him, you don't have long to live, after what you have done. You may ask forgiveness of God and you can be forgiven. But you have cut the years of your life and reduced them to just a few more months. Use those months well, because you are your own murderer. I left him with his mouth open and went out. He understood before I did that I just made a divine revelation to him, the type I have no control for. Unfortunately, I had already distributed a considerable number of copies of that book to my most trusted friends and acquaintances. I had done so as soon as the books were delivered and before I had even read it. I had even given six copies to the Cameroonian ambassador, His Excellency Bola Lima, and some of his staff. When I explained the situation to my friends, all those to whom I gave copies refused to give them back to me when I asked, even when I offered to refund money to those who had bought theirs. They argued that those copies would be worth something when the real message comes out, and they wanted to see exactly how the message had been altered. I eventually allowed Felipe back into the marital bed, but something had been broken in me. For a while I had come to trust him implicitly and I avoided listening to his thoughts but now I was on my guard. Many times he tried to discuss my last revelation to him, but somehow I simply could not talk about it. I told him that it was between him and God, but if he wanted an advice or any counseling, I was available. Somehow I could see him slowly changing before my very eyes as the weeks and months went by. He regularly said that he knew the difference between good and evil, but was constantly tempted to do bad things, and he could not cope with the struggle within him. Many more of the misdeeds he had committed during our time together came to light, which resulted in me calling the police, and to him being arrested and to forcefully being removed from the marital home on Christmas Eve of that year. It is said, it is never good to speak ill of the dead, so I prefer not to say any more, because in 1993 on the last day of December, just a few months after I had made my prediction, seven days after he was asked to leave our house, my husband died, he was 29. He never totally escaped from Rail's brainwashing, I am afraid to say, and his death was a direct result of what Rail's teachings had done to him. He jumped to his death in front of a train at Barking Station, in East London. I lost another two years during which I was deeply depressed, and I could not pluck up the enormous courage and the strength I needed to concentrate and access the message that was hidden deep in my subconscious mind. Again in 1996, I started to write this message, having had to access it from where Elianin had recorded it, as Philippe had destroyed the first discs, and as the manuscript had been confiscated by that Roman Catholic priest. And as I have already said, the first book that had been printed was useless, as so much had been added to it, and the message did not even appear in it as I had typed it. Still on my old Amstrad PCW 9512, 
I again managed to type up to the time when I had met the Antichrist in London, then something unnerving happened. The machine was now in my bedroom where I was now doing the typing, and it was the middle of the afternoon. As I typed, I suddenly got a spiritual warning of danger, and I acted immediately. I quickly placed a protection circle around me as I had been trained to do, and something that I can only describe as a malevolent presence entered my bedroom, just as I finished closing the circle of defense around my body. I would have placed it around the whole house, but there has not been much time. With my mind totally attuned and concentrated on accessing the message, I had not felt the being approach or even enter my house. I understood later that my holy guardian angel had shouted the warning at me, as he had done on other occasions when I had been in danger. I froze as the presence slowly came in through the door which was on my left-hand side. It went round my back and came and stood behind my right shoulder. For a while, I did not type and sat waiting. A great amount of heat was generated from the being and I began to sweat profusely. It felt like I had been suddenly placed in front of a huge bonfire. I felt the anger of the being and I knew it was reading what I had typed. Then I finally spoke, whoever you are, please, leave. And I mentally began calling both on Elianen and my holy guardian angel for protection. Actually I quickly realized that I had just offended my holy guardian angel by calling Elianen as well as him. Who knew where Elianen were? They could not simply appear beside me when I called on them, unless they were actually in orbit over earth. Whatever was threatening me now, only my holy guardian angel could save me from. That was why he had come and warned me to put up the protection. So I apologized to him and begged him to save me. Whatever was in my room was very physical, but I knew better than trying to reach out to find out. It was invisible, but I could guess its height and feel it. Somehow, it saw the defense I had put up, but it hesitated. Right at that moment my holy guardian angel appeared and I also felt him, though I did not see him, and whatever stood behind me moved slightly back. I knew that it also had seen him. I was now fortified and knew that nothing would happen to me so I repeated in a stronger voice. Please, leave me alone. Leave my house and go away. The presence remained where it stood. I decided to type again, as I got a mental warning from my angel to save what I had been typing all day. As I understood why he was warning me, I grabbed the computer's mouse, but the being was faster. Suddenly the plug was yanked out of the wall and the screen went black. I sat there staring at the screen and shaking, as I felt the presence leave my bedroom. But this time it did not go through the door, it went up through the ceiling, and this time I caught a flash of light as it went. I was certain that I had just been visited by one of Rail's alien Elohims. I wasted some three minutes, frozen on my chair, violently spooked by seeing the computer's plug being pulled out by those invisible hands. Then I thought about rushing out and looking up in the sky. I ran outside, but of course it was too late. Three minutes for those creatures was enough time for them to shoot clear of earth. As I slowly walked back inside, I reflected that again, things were not going to be as easy as I had thought they would be. Surely I was alone, I had long cut contact with the few Raelians I knew. And I was not exactly on good terms with my in-laws. I had ignored all the letters they had written to me, as all they wanted to do was fight with me. But somehow, Rail's aliens knew that I had again begun writing a Lionin's message, and they were determined to stop it being published. Well, I lost all that day's work, but I still had what I had saved before. So I learned my lesson. And I began saving everything I typed as I went along. I fell violently ill after that being had come to my room. I suffered from violent headaches and I vomited all the time. My back felt constantly as if it was against a hot radiator and that heat also came with a burning sensation. My right foot also felt that way, in fact it still feels that way to this day. The feeling is like my right ankle has been scalded by boiling water, and the pain comes and goes in waves. I was also very nervous and shaky, and any sudden movement caused me to nearly jump out of my skin. And for that I preferred to stay indoors, venturing outside only for grocery shopping. It was in fact two whole months, before I resumed typing though, and I managed to get the whole message out of my mind again. Meanwhile, 
I had noticed that the inside of my nostrils had swollen, looking a very dark pink and it was becoming difficult for me to breathe. In early 1995 I sent the manuscript for one of those publishers who regularly advertise in the daily newspapers and weekly magazines. I enclosed a very large and embossed, stamped and self-addressed envelope and also a postal order for the future return of the manuscript. Two weeks later, as I had not received any letter confirming the receipt of the manuscript, I telephoned them and one lady told me that an acknowledgement letter had been sent to me. She indeed remembered it as she had typed it herself. Then she told me that one of their editors would call me later. Another two weeks later, the large self-addressed envelope that I had sent with the manuscript came through the post. I recognized it immediately and thought that my manuscript had been returned. Instead, it contained nothing but an old British telecom directory. As I sat puzzling over this, my telephone rang, and it was a male voice. Hello, I just wanted you to know that I am Aurelian, and I work at the publishing company. I can promise you that your book will never see the light of day. The phone went dead. As I was now very uncomfortable with my partially blocked nostrils, I visited my doctor, who somehow was reluctant to tell me what was wrong with my nose, but arranged for me to be admitted to hospital for an operation. After months of useless telephone calls, the publishers could not find my manuscript. None of them knew who that Raelian was, they said, and none of them admitted having made that telephone call to me. And I finally understood that I had lost yet another manuscript of the message to yet another publishing company. I decided to recommence accessing the message immediately, but when I tried to type it, I found that my PCW 9512 would no longer work, and it was a new machine. Down again I sank into depression, as that same year, my stepfather died in Cameroon. I bought another PCW, but I had no energy to work. I also finally received an appointment for my operation, scheduled for summer 1997, and thus the whole year went by. In January 1997 I again decided to access the message, and I was amazed that I could still get it out, virtually word for word. It was becoming difficult now to do so though, and I found myself preparing as I usually do when working on the mysteries, still my memory, thanks to Elianin, served me well. Whatever Elianin had done to my brain was now proving very useful. But just a week after I began typing again, I received another phone call from Africa, my sister, Fiette, was gravely ill. I had not gone back to Cameroon since I came over to England 17 years earlier, so I decided to go this time, also as my brother was telling me that they did not think my sister would survive that illness. So I left off accessing the message and went to Africa. The situation was just as it had been described to me. I could only stay two weeks, but I did not fail to visit my dear grandmother at our village. Everything in the village had changed, houses looked different. Many had been demolished and rebuilt in different styles. But many of the old villas that I had left were still there. In our compound, my uncle had had our coconut tree cut down. Many of the old folks in our community had died, and those people who were in their middle ages when I had left, now looked slightly older. But time seemed to have stood still for others, as is usual with our beautiful negroid genes. They did not seem more than two years older than I remembered them. My grandmother was now 83 years old, 83, and looked older, but she virtually had no wrinkles, though she now seemed shorter than I remembered her. Her age showed in the way she walked, in her eyes and on her hair that was now grey. Also, she now looked more like her mother, my great-grandmother. The situation in our community was even sorrier. Special worship had been abandoned. Some who still cared to worship did so at home. The rest now attended different Christian churches, probably because they had discovered that the churches were not very demanding in religious practices. However, the small group that I set up before coming to England was still going strong, only, they have no proper teacher to lead them. One of the men, Martin, had taken over the leading of the religious services. I intend to send any of the first people that I will train in the mysteries there as soon as they are ready. After all, that is where I was given the land for the first citadel, which will also be our headquarters in Africa. After two weeks I returned to England, but the state of my sister had appalled me. 
As I knew that she would die, I no longer had the willpower or the energy that I needed to access the message in my mind. So I passed my days in a haze, waiting for the news of Fiette's death. And it came just three months later. My dear sister, so petite, so pretty, and still so young-looking, died in April 1997 in her early forties, but looking not a year older than twenty-five, thanks to the genes of which we are proud in our bloodline. And I sat mourning till the end of the year, not accessing the message. But that summer, I was operated on, and all the swollen tissue in my nostrils was removed. During that operation, I had an experience in which I went to the other side. Unfortunately the operation seemed to have lasted just a few minutes to me, and I was awakened by a nurse, soon after I was brought from the operating theater. I was rather angry at being pulled back from where I was, and told off the nurse for bringing me back. And what was more, I was in a lot of pain and simply hated being back in my body. As I exclaimed, why did you do that? Why did you bring me back? The nurse stared at me with round eyes, then she ran off calling for I do not know which doctor and shouting. Doctor! Another one! Come and hear her! She is angry at having been brought back. The doctor came, and tried to get me to talk to him and tell him what I had meant. But I was now in so much pain that I refused to talk, contenting myself to moan, asking for painkillers. A week later, after I had left the hospital, I remember being awakened in my bedroom by a beep, beep, beep sound, and finding myself floating in mid-air and being lowered onto my bed. It was about 2.30 a.m. in the morning, and I remember thinking that a lionin will be behind that levitation. It was after that, that I began to feel a lot better than I had felt since the operation. With the decision of accessing the message in my mind, I had this time also got myself into counseling therapy. I wanted to be sure that a professional mind specialist kept me in check, and if I became mad, the psychotherapist would be on hand to point me in the right direction. Finally in 1999 after I had worked hard I finished writing the third manuscript. I then enrolled on a course at the University of East London, so I had a lot of studying and reading to do, as well as typing that manuscript. But in the summer, as I was about to begin printing it out, I came home to find the PCW 9512, which I had again brought downstairs, lying on the living room floor, a large crack at its base. Whatever happened, I do not know, only that the machine could not have fallen down unless it had been pushed. Nobody in my family had touched it, I knew that, they all respect my work, and never touch anything that I leave anywhere in the house. So I could only conclude that one of the renegades had paid me another visit. I again bought a second-hand PCW 9512 just to copy out my manuscript. This time I put the discs in a small safe that I specially bought. As I was now filled with renewed enthusiasm and was again looking for a publisher, I received the news that my biological father had died. I refused to believe that my father was dead, and I refused to sink into depression this time. With my whole being I pushed the news out of my memory and did not even cry, neither did I tie a mourning band on my wrist, I also did not tell the news to my children. Instead, I chose to deal only with my book, and I sent the manuscript this time to another publishing company called Minerva Press. I had seen it advertised regularly for years, and I had even read some Minerva Press books, so I decided to try them. They sent me some of the books they had recently published, and which they said had been bestsellers. I actually did like one of them, Climbing Up from the Rough Side of the Mountain by Tom King, a brave and gutsy black man who had come from the Caribbean and who had gone on to be elected mayor of London's borough of Southwark. So, I trusted Minerva Press, only, they were asking for a £7,000 payment, to be paid in installments. I signed and sent them the contract, but I wisely withheld the first installment. I enclosed a letter telling them to edit the book as they were proposing, and if I liked the way the editing was done, I would send them my first payment. I was determined not to spend and lose a penny more, until I was satisfied with what I was getting. But after I sent that signed contract, I never heard from them again. I wrote many letters asking for my manuscript back, but there came no replies. When I dialed their telephone number, the line sounded cut off. Finally, in 2003, I used the internet search engine Google, 
and I discovered that they had gone bust, and not only that, they were accused of dishonest activities. As a matter of fact I realized that they had sent me that contract and their payment demand as they were already going out of business. If I had sent them the money, they would never have even printed the book. They would have simply stolen the money. Once again, I had been deceived, and that is how I lost that third manuscript for this time. Some precious photographs that I had sent with the manuscript were also lost. I was now feeling so helpless that I had begun strongly thinking of forgetting about Elianin, about the message and about Rail. It seemed that Satan had won. I mean, how could I be three times so unlucky? And suddenly the memory of my father's death hit me in a case of delayed reaction. I stopped going to lectures, and it was the year when I was supposed to graduate. Since my father died, I had lost two of my cousins, both of the same mother and father, and all of which I grew up with. They died within months of each other. As I sat in my bedroom feeling totally dejected, this voice boomed in my bedroom, the worst is yet to come. I slowly raised my head. The voice has sounded in the room all around me, not in my head. I was not even startled or afraid. I warily looked around the bedroom and replied, yes, why stop there? What else can you do now, except kill me? Then I went into the bathroom, stuck my finger in my throat and brought up all the food I had eaten. I had already suffered bulimia in 1986 to 1988 during that time when I had struggled about writing this message and contacting the Raelians. Now I felt so trapped and helpless with that message locked in my head and the prospect of contacting the Raelians that I felt I were losing control of myself and the only way I could feel that I still had free will was to stop myself digesting any food or putting on weight. I lost so much weight that all size 8 clothes, equivalent of today's size 6, began to hang loose on me. I went shopping one day, and was shopped in a shop, when the girl who was helping me choose a dress, told me that if I lost any more weight, I would look like a skeleton. As usual, I had managed to pull myself from the brink, I began to eat again and I went on to contact the Raelians. This second time in 2003, I was more controlled. Though I tried not to sink back into bringing up everything I ate, I let off steam in other ways, by being absolutely horrible to one of my anthropology lecturers for example, after I went back to study. In fact, if I am honest, I had been specially that way since I began taking the course. To this day, I cannot even understand why I acted that way since I actually liked that lecturer, and admired his intelligence. All I can say is that he is a Darwinian, and I resented that he taught the theory of evolution as absolute fact. As far as I am concerned, all theories are supposed to be taught and to be discussed as such, no matter what those who teach and discuss them believe personally. At least if he reads this, he might console himself by learning that he was not the only one I treated that way, I was horrible to all. I suddenly left the anthropology course and enrolled on another one, politics. Luckily I started that one directly from year two. But in 2004, what that voice had said in my bedroom came true, and as we say, the sky fell on my head. In February 2004, my youngest sister Henriette died in Africa, after undergoing a surgical operation. I was refused a visa at the Cameroonian embassy because my passport only had five months before it expired. So I was prevented from going to her burial. In May 2004, my beloved grandmother died. I managed to go to her burial this time. They had to keep her body at a funeral parlor for nearly two months, waiting for me, but I made it. In December 2004, my last surviving sister Madeline, who also had been living in the United Kingdom all this time, died of a brain aneurysm, while in Latvia with her husband. To say that I could no longer cope with what was happening in my life would be an understatement. I had seen eight members of my family die in quick succession, and I simply do not know from where I summoned any energy to do anything. A large number of people came from our family in Africa for my sister's funeral, amongst them Raymond, the eldest son of my stepfather's first wife, who as such, was my sister's biological brother on her father's side. She was buried in January 2005, and a few months later, we got another telephone call, Raymond had been murdered, shot dead by armed criminals who wanted his car. 
I could not go to Africa this time, so I fought back by trying to print out a new copy of this message. However, the task proved impossible. The third PCW 9512 machine that I had bought now refused to work. There was nothing wrong with it, I had all the disks but I was stuck again, as those Amstrad types of computer I had used were virtually obsolete by then. And I did not know of anyone who could copy the manuscript out for me on modern 1.44 floppy disks. Anyway, I had by now bought a proper computer, with which I had been writing all my university essays. So at last, in December 2005, I went into my bedroom with a cup of cocoa and tried to access the message again. I was sitting at my personal computer when it easily came streaming into my mind. But as I sat writing at midnight, the message went away, to be replaced by a need to put a coat on and go for a walk. After vainly fighting that desire, I saved my work, switched the computer off, put on a coat, a pair of boots, a hat and gloves, and went out. Immediately as I stepped out, I was filled with that old feeling of foreboding. No cars passed, there were no dog walkers, no late revelers, and even no foxes in sight. Somehow I decided to go to Good Maze Park, which is across the road from my house. I do not know why I wanted to go there, as I knew that the door into my side of the park was always closed in the evenings. Also I normally would never dare go there at night, because I sometimes fear the shadows under trees in darkness. Still I went. I headed toward the park, round our local primary school, which is next to it, and amazingly, I found the park door opened. That door is always locked every night. As I slowly walked towards the lake, I could not believe it when right there, where my children have always played football, but nearer to the trees, I found a small shining silver vessel standing there, with no lights on at all. I first stopped in surprise, my heart leaping in my chest, then I firmly advanced towards it. Somehow I knew that those were my friends, not renegade foes. I knew that they could not have any lights flashing, as they would attract attention. I also understood why I had not seen any cars pass in our avenue. As I approached, a tall male shadow detached itself from behind a tree, the man came closer, brought his arms to his chest and said, Peace be with you. Disarray. Shalom, I replied without thinking. As I arrived before him, I recognized one of Elianin, who had met me so many years ago, in 1973. It was the black one. The door of the craft opened, it was still dark inside. He went in and I followed him. As the door closed behind me the soft light came on inside. In there, were the one called Uriel, and one of the short, small aliens, None of them looked a day older than when I had last seen them. This vessel was quite small and elongated. It was just one room, and a glass partition separated the small flying deck or cockpit from the sitting or passenger area. After the usual greetings, the little man went into the cockpit, closed the partition and sat down. The black one pointed at one of the seats, smiling at me, here he said. I sat down and he pressed a small handheld device, and I felt myself secured on the seat as I remembered. You understand we cannot stay here, he said again, and I nodded. The vessel rose silently in the sky, going straight up and in no time, we were very high up above the clouds, then it took the direction of the English Channel, I think. In a very short time we landed on a deserted isle. Our seat restraints were released and I suddenly felt very cold. I told them this, and immediately the inside of the small vessel became comfortably warm, while the area where the little alien was, remained freezing cold. The black alien looked piercingly at me and said, You have changed, you are an adult now, and you are big. Meaning by that, I was overweight. Well unlike you, we humans grow old. Time does not stand still for us, we also eat, and our shapes change as we age. I replied, then I broke into tears, crying uncontrollably. I found a small pack of tissue in my coat pocket, pulled one out, dried my eyes and blew my nose. My weeping took them by surprise and they stared fixedly at me. Then the white one seizing himself, said briskly. Calm down, we have come to talk to you, again he said, emphasizing the word again. Why did you ever ask me to transmit your message? 
I told you that it was a task that was bound to be difficult for me, and it has been I said accusingly. Do you even know what I have been through? Do you know what the followers of Viril have done in my life? And do you know that one of the renegades came into my house? Do you know that he came into my bedroom? And what with my state of mind, what with my mental health, I now suffer from depression, I now have OCD, do you know that? And do you even care? You people have driven me mad. You ruined my life, my entire life. And without waiting for an answer, I gave them a complete account of my life, from the moment I had last seen them in 1973 till 2005. I left nothing out, and they listened to me without interrupting me. I told them of the many times I had nearly been murdered by different individuals. I reported on my meeting with Rail, and also about my child's attempted murder by Rachel van Dyliard. I told them about my husband's interference with the first manuscript, and about his suicide. I told them about many members of my family dying every year, about my bad health, and the many times I had had to access their message in my mind, then lost the manuscripts, and of the only copies that I had had printed, but which I had later had to burn. I also spoke of my financial difficulties, and of my inability to find any employment. When I finally finished, I felt emptied and very tired as I went quiet and leant back on my seat. The one called Uriel spoke, Yes, we know that your life has been very difficult, we also know the efforts you have made so far in trying to have our message published. And look, we even obtained this. And from under his robes he brought out a very clean copy of that first book. I was immensely surprised. How did you get hold of this? I asked. One of us purchased it from you that day when you visited that public park in London, he replied. Then I remembered that day at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, when I had gone there with Philippe, and he had brought a few copies of the book, before I had even read it. I shook my head, how could Philippe even try to get people to read this, when he knew that it was not accurate? Well, he was listening to, and serving Satan. He wanted you to be discredited if and when you published our message the way we gave it to you. But no one can truly discredit me, can they? What still comes through is that I am very strongly opposed to Viriln and that I designate him as an anti-messiah. But which of you bought the book? I asked. I remember an old white man, and a young black man. Yes, he replied, but your husband sold another copy to a young lady, right before he was set upon by a group of young Arab men. I also remembered that scene. I had left him alone for a few minutes, and when I came back, I found him looking terrified and surrounded by menacing and shouting Arab young men, who had seen him wearing a kerpa on his head and had assumed that he was a Hebrew. The brown alien told me that they knew that I was angry about the book, they also knew the many times I had struggled to have it published and failed. And they knew, he said, about the renegade who had come into my room. They had seen my distress call and had tried to come over, but they had become engaged in battle above the moon, after being attacked by the renegades. He informed me that they were always around and close to Earth every time the renegades entered Earth space, as they now monitored every single one of their movements in our area of space. He congratulated me on how I had dealt with the renegade who had come into my room, and told me that the renegades were under strict instructions not to harm me in any way. He said that if I get hurt by them in any way whatsoever, they will immediately enter an official state of the general war with them. He assured me that when I die, it would not be by the hands of the renegades. He then confirmed to me that they had come and done some work on me, two weeks after I came from the hospital after that operation in my nostrils. He said, we had to be sure that you were cured, and that nothing will come back. They had missed and left a few cells that would have become dangerous for your health, if left to develop. And yes, your illness came as a result of being exposed to that renegade. I tried to ask him to explain a bit more about that, but he told me that it would serve no purpose for me to know exactly what it was. They did not want to frighten me. He then told me that they had come to renew and strengthen me, so that I might go ahead and transmit their message. Many things were told to me, that I am not allowed to disclose, but Uriel talked a lot about humanity of the future and the huge human potential. For example he said, Tell the people of Earth. Our ancestors discovered and prepared this planet about two and a half billion Earth years ago. 
and if you look after it well, Earth still has at least a few hundreds of thousands of years of life, or more, before anything catastrophic happens to it, as we have calculated. So stop believing silly, enslaving and intimidating stories about Jesus coming back to Earth at the end of this millennium, to save the good and take them to paradise, or whatever you have been taught. Yeshua, or Jesus as you like to call him, was simply a man and a rabbi, who lived and died, just like countless other human beings have lived and died on earth. Unless a sample of his DNA was preserved by humanity so that he may be cloned, there is no way that he could come back to earth, looking like he did. We could recreate him by cloning him, if we wanted to, because we took his DNA during one of the many times when we met with him. But we would never do that, because he never wanted, or asked us to recreate him, neither did he ever want anyone to worship him the way he is being worshipped now. Therefore recreating him would serve no useful purpose. Yeshua died two thousands years ago and he will remain dead. He will never come back, not in the body he died with. Our messenger, she who shall give you this message, has been given the duty to try and give you all, and teach what part of the mysteries Yeshua started to give and teach, but which he never finished doing. You should understand that your planet, the galaxy in which Earth is and which you call the Milky Way, and your universe even, are nothing but a tiny speck in the immensity of the infinity of space. You should stop believing in the idea that Earth is the only inhabited planet in your immense universe. Therefore stop that Christian superstition of limiting your existence time to just a thousand more years. Jesus is never going to come back. A being shall certainly come to Earth, which shall be known as the Messiah, but that being shall not be Jesus. And after him, many others will come who, one after the other, will be messianic beings and who will do the work they are destined to do, before dying and leaving, to be replaced later by yet other messianic beings. Life on earth could come to an end, only by the foolishness and madness of humanity itself, or because of a natural disaster, like the planet being hit by a very large asteroid. But you on earth are not alone. We are out there in space, and we monitor all those bodies that roam loose throughout your galaxy, and if we see something that is remotely likely to come into collision with Earth, we will do all that is in our power to deflect it from its course. Also, there is a very remote danger that the renegades, of whom we speak in our message might try something, as we have already said. But we will never let them do so without protecting and helping you. So just like Claude Viril will have faithful and loyal followers, let those who believe in our message attach themselves to this messenger that we send you, and endeavor to gather together people who believe in God and who are willing to seek to do what they had truly transmigrated to earth to achieve. We want her to establish the Essene order again and to get her followers to swear allegiance to God, and put it in writing, just like Satan's followers have been doing for centuries. Simply saying that they believe in God is no longer enough. Man must be willing to sell his soul to God, as Satanists and devil worshippers sell their souls to the devil. There is something spiritually binding about vows and pacts that man does not seem to grasp. We too want to see lists of names of people who are willing to belong to God, and who are willing to put their souls as a price. They can do that through their respective religious denominations. They can also come to our messenger, make their promise, and put their names on the lists that the Essene order will keep, whichever they prefer. We would never abandon you, and when man needs us we will come and help. Also, we did just the rough work in our work of creation on earth, and we encourage you to do us proud and do even more than we did. We did our best in eliminating all diseases that could be transmitted to earth people from us, but humanity should do more. From time to time some dormant genes might be awakened and could trigger some unknown disease to flare up. Humanity should do their best to find cures for those. Know that within the human body is all you need to cure and eliminate any new and old diseases you may suffer from. Within the human body is all that is needed to regrow any lost limbs. Master cells from any part of the body are what is needed to cure what needs curing, and to replace what needs replacing. Certain cells need only switching off for humanity to deal with many conditions presently plaguing them now, and in the futures. Those need to be found, identified and easily dealt with. There are other genes which also need switching on to help you. 
In our world, when a child is born, we siphon out and preserve all amniotic fluids, all placentas and all umbilical cords, with the blood contained in the cords. We keep all baby teeth that fall naturally as they usually do, none of those are discarded. They are kept in sterile environment in laboratories, are used instead for the curing and correction of any illnesses and malfunctions that may occur in the life of the person, also for growing new, healthy limbs and body parts, and many more similar uses. We also want to remind you that there is absolutely nothing to do with nature where the human race is concerned. Just as we created man in laboratories, humanity must never hesitate to use genetic engineering to better themselves and to correct any abnormalities wherever they occur. Make all effort to research and study the human anatomy and physiology, and discover that small muscle which when cut off, the aging process is interrupted for a long time before starting up again, thus lengthening your lives by hundreds of years and more. Chance had nothing to do with how human beings look. Everything was engineered and done to precision. Take something now as accepted as the difference of eye colors amongst human beings. All the first beings we created had brown-colored eyes. We experimented with the cells that determines the skin color on the first humans we created, in order to produce human beings with blue, green, gray, and violet eyes. That way, we also produced human beings with blonde, red and brown colored hair. Do not ask us to show you how it is done, you must discover how to do it by yourselves. We encourage you to begin cloning human beings, there is absolutely nothing ethically wrong about it. You have the technology now, and you understand the procedure and how it is done. When having children, tissue from each child should be taken and preserved, so when in their adult years, parents lose their children, they should have the right to replace them with copies, so as to preserve their bloodlines from becoming extinct. Remember that we informed you about incubating babies in giant machines, which were nothing but artificial wombs to grow the babies in. No couple should be without a biological child if they want one, even if the wife cannot give birth naturally for any reason. And no woman should go through the pain of childbirth if she does not want to feel it, neither should she carry a child if she wishes to preserve a perfect, youthful and undamaged body. Therefore we urge you to research and study the human female womb and to create artificial ones. Perfect yourselves, make your way of life easier and more enjoyable, as much and as quickly as you can. Why should people wear artificial teeth, when man now has the technology to grow new ones, right where the old ones had been? Racial discrimination and segregation is an insult to us, your creators, because you are all part of us, and we do not see any one race or species superior to, or better than the others on account of their skin color, their stature or their planet or galaxy of provenance. You are all one race, the human race. You should instead take pleasure in getting to know those who are physically different from yourselves, love, admire, and enjoy their beauty, their customs, and their exoticism. Just enjoy that beautiful world we prepared and made available to you all, and continue with the scientific researches where we left off. Those amongst you who already enjoy better ways of lives must get together and help those who are still struggling to also live better lives. Let no religious leader advise you to live poor humble lives and give him all your hard-earned fortunes, in order for you to stock up treasures in heaven. God did certainly did not teach us or our ancestors to impoverish ourselves, in order to enrich our religious leaders. Besides, before you can give your riches to religious institutions, you have to earn them yourselves. Therefore enjoy what you earn at the sweat of your brows, then give some to the religious institutions, as well as giving to those people who are less well provided for than yourselves. We do not want to discourage you from giving to religious institutions, because it is an important matter. Your lives as a community should revolve around the place where you get spiritual nourishment and most of all where you can realize your divinities. It is a divine duty for all communities to provide for building places of worship and to gift those with a tenth of what you earn for the continuation of the work of those who attend to your spiritual needs. But you also have only the one life to live, in the bodies you each inhabit. Therefore you should enjoy that life with every fiber of your being. And you should endeavor and seek to be materially rich or at least very comfortable, you and your families. God does not want anyone to be poor. 
Therefore the lady who will bring you this message will explain to you the exact meanings of the sayings of Rabbi Yeshua, on the subject of his conversation with that rich young man, when he told him to sell what he had, and give it to the poor. Those words, which are not even his exact words, were not meant to be taken literally. We do not encourage anyone to disinherit their relatives, or sell or give away what they own in order to earn a place in paradise. Of course, if you do not have any relatives, then you should feel free to dispose of your fortunes any way you like. But to do so when there is the chance of any potential genetic heirs being in existence is a very wicked sin that should not be committed. Having said that, giving to charity is the best use that your riches could be put to, after you have provided for all your loved ones, especially giving to ease poverty on earth, is highly recommended, for God so loves the poor that it cannot properly be described. God gives riches to some people on earth, so that they may help and ease the suffering of those who have nothing. We have given you our message, as this our messenger tells you in her book. What she tells you does come from us. Let those who believe that message join her, and help her spread it. It is up to you now, we will be watching you. As I was advised, that is all I can tell from that meeting, the rest of what I was told is not for the eyes and ears of the profane, and will be given to those who will come to me, seeking their divine realization. After three hours, I was given a large glassful of that mint tasting liquid, and I was told to swallow it, which I did. Then I was given a small glass of another honey-colored one and was told to take in small mouthfuls until the glass was empty. Again I did so. Then the two asked me to stand up, they placed their hands on my head and prayed to God in English, for me. Then they both blessed me in turns, just like Grandfather had blessed me all those years ago. Finally, the white one emptied a small phial of strong nice-smelling oil on my head, while the small alien had come and stood to witness the ceremony, with his head bowed. We all sat down again as the small alien returned to the cockpit and I understood that we were about to return to London. Oh, can I ask you something, if I may? I asked them. Of course they replied in unison. Do you mind if I use my own name, both on the book and during my future work? It is just that the renegades gave Virilna a name, as you know. And right now, I don't feel like following suit. I no longer want to use that name you. If you wish, it is no big deal. Yes. Uriel alone replied. When they had given me their message in 1973, it had been suggested that I use the name of Uriel as the author of the book. I had said to them that people would end up calling me by that name, and they had said I should let them, if that happens. But I have gone through so much that I no longer wish to accouter myself with all those trimmings. I explained that I did not want to be like Viril. So it was agreed that I could use my own name. As the space vessel rose, I felt myself sinking into a beautiful, warm and comfortable sleep. Later, I was awakened by a sharp beep, 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 sound. I opened my eyes, and found myself with my nose against my bedroom ceiling, floating above my bed, and all being slowly lowered down. As I became aware of my surroundings, whatever was holding me in the air suddenly let go, and I fell heavily on my bed. And I lay there, still tasting the sweet liquid, my bedroom now full of the heavenly smell of the oil that I could still touch and feel in my hair, and see on my fingers. During the night, as I went to sleep again, I discovered that more had been recorded in my brain. I woke up with a renewed energy, and a firm resolve. Nothing could stop me now and nothing would make me back down. Elionen had come and renewed my strength. I will finish writing the message, and I would see it published, or I would die trying. So the following morning, I started writing again, and did not stop till I had accessed it all. Well need I say more? I believe I have done it all here what a lion in charged me with. I have transmitted their message as they had given it. Uriel had advised me to make myself talked about in the media. I have also done that, though I may have to do it again. As I explained, I unwittingly came to the media attention in 1992 when I tried to build a traditional oratory in the back garden of my Essex Council house, in order to observe my Essene religious disciplines and rituals. Unfortunately, as I built the oratory in mud, some snooty English people in my area objected. 
and the whole subject resulted in a much-publicized fight between my local council and myself, thus I became a celebrity. Many people since then have advised me to write my life story, but I am afraid I could not do that because I had nothing important to say about myself. But I had this message that was worthy of much attention from humanity on the whole. And I hope that with this book, the curiosity of those people about me will be satisfied. But most of all I, hope that they would welcome and believe the message that I convey here, it is the most important they should remember, when they think about me. Before Desireen Tolo the mud hut builder, there was Desireen Tolo, the messenger of Elianan. And if that is what Elianan meant when they told me to bring myself to the attention of the world media, I hope that those headlines will help bring more interest my way, and towards the message of Elianan. I have transmitted it here as it was given me. And no doubt the reader has noticed many repetitions made by Uriel while transmitting his story. That is very normal, since he never had any written documents to read from, while he spoke to me. In fact, none of them had any documents. All their dictations were made thanks to their mental and recollection abilities. I rather welcome those repetitions, now that I can read the message myself, and I hope that the reader will too. I too have made many repetitions here. I know because I have been printing out and reading what I wrote as I went along. But there were bound to be repetitions since I have been writing the message directly on the computer as I accessed it, not by long hand as before. How can I convince anyone of the truth of my encounters with a lion and of their existence? It is impossible for me to do so, that is part of my reality. But I can convince the reader of the existence on earth of Claude Varil and of the book he wrote. I can convince the reader of the existence of the Raelian and the Geniocrat political movements. Let those attest for me, justify me, and be my witnesses before humanity. I have now come to the end of this first book. The next ones will convey in full the story of Rabbi Yeshua as witnessed by my ancestor Pinchas the Levite. And I can promise that his version of most of the events certainly differ from that given by the Romans. I have enclosed contact forms here for the use of those who accept and hopefully believe in what Elianin say. Please, fill the forms and get in touch with me. I shall be waiting. The End Underscore Bibliography The Holy Bible The Book of Mormon Marks by Robert Payne Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler Benito Mussolini by Christopher Hibbert Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson by G.I. Gurdjieff in three-volume Spear of Destiny by Ravenscroft. Hitler's Table Talks by Martin Bormann, George Weifenfeld and Nicholson Limited. Thanks for kind permission to use Extracts The Secrets of Mount Sinai, Orbis Publications Hitler and the Age of Horus by Gerald Suster. The Message by Claude Verilne Rail. Let Us Welcome Our Fathers from Space by Claude Verilne Rail. Geniocracy by Claude Verilne Rail. Sensual Meditation by Claude Verilm Rail Many attempts have been made to contact some of the publishers of the books mentioned in this publication. I will be happy for them to get in touch. The Order of the Essenes slash Membership Form For a copy of our membership form, please contact the author of this video.